I greet everyone with the peace of the Lord Jesus. I invite the church to stand up in reverence to the word of the Lord. We are going to read from the Old Testament, First Chronicles. Chapter 11, first verse, first Chronicles, chapter 11, first Chronicles, 11, verse 1 and verse 10, first verse and 10th verse. First Chronicles 11, verse 1st and 10th. Amen. Verse 1st says the following. The text speaks of the anointing of David when he was appointed to be the king. Then all Israel came together to David at Hebron, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Now verse 10 says the following. Now these were the heads of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom, with all Israel to make him king, according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Now, chapter 12, verse 32. 12:32 says the following. Of the son of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, ought to do. The chiefs were two hundred, and all their brethren were at their command. Lord, we praise you and glorify your holy name. As we enjoy your fellowship, we ask, Lord, that throughout the service, that, that we may be able to once again uh, have your name glorified. We pray in the name of Jesus. The church may be seated. When we hear, when we read, chapter 11 and chapter 12 of the book of Chronicles, we'll see the description of what is and what represents the kingdom of David and David for us. And what he didn't fail in the presence of the Lord, he is a symbol of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So here, here is the description of the work of the Lord, the plan of the Lord for the life of Israel and also for our lives, for the life of the church. And the word says that, and already in the first verse, it already speaks of a body. The Bible says that and all Israel came together to David at Hebron. So it says, we are your bones and your flesh. So they, they were all connected. They were, they were all united. They were all in fellowship with the kingdom of David. And more than that, they had fellowship with one another. We are your bones and we are your flesh. We are the body, in other words. And you, David, is the head of this body. And that's what God wants to see in His church. That we declare that we are the body of Christ and Jesus is our head. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our guide. Because all of those men, they were guided by David. And what is interesting in the kingdom, David already going ahead a little bit, is that he never lost a battle. He never lost a war. And when we see in the New Testament, 
a verse that says the following, because we are more than victorious. So all of those that were in the kingdom that David, that gathered with David, they were all victorious. And my brethren, the Bible speaks of many men, not worthy men, amazing men. It speaks of a group that existed there where they would take a stone that would put on a sling and at a certain distance they would put a string of hair and those men with, with the sling were able to hit the string of hair so we can see the dexterity, the competence, the training that those men had in order not to miss the target. And we have a target. And who is our, our target? The Lord Jesus. Looking towards Jesus. So whenever we do this, we hit the target. There were men, the Bible says, that were known as heroes, David's heroes. Men that were that had had done deeds that were extraordinary, noteworthy men. The Bible says that David had thirty-seven heroes, thirty-seven valiant men, and amongst those thirty-seven, there were three that were stood out amongst all the others. And uh, it's written in the book of Chronicles, and it's also written in the book of Samuel. In the book of Samuel. He makes a reference more precise regarding the 37 valents of David. He speaks of uh, regarding those men. The first one was called Joseph Barsabash. This first man, he was the main of the captains. He op fought against 800 men and he uh, Killed them all at once, uh, alone. He he had a, a spear and he fought against 800 op oppositors and w wounded them all at once. He he spawned a spear and with the spear he wounded 800 enemies all at once. Is a type of the work of the Holy Spirit. Is a type of the Holy Spirit that opposed to the enemy that overcomes our enemies, our battles. He's the one that opposed. And as we, when we read and the letters that we are reading now, Book of Revelations, we see the opposition of the enemy. And we also see the opposition of the Holy Spirit. The opposition of Jesus in relation to what was happening. So that his servants would not deviate from the plan and the project of God. So what we see that there were men, there were extraordinary, valiant men, uh, men that did this, they, were, they, they had the characteristic of men that had, were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the word says that there was another man. His name was Eleazar. It was son of a doctor. And it's interesting that the Bible gives all the genealogy. And it was amongst the three valents that were with David. And when the Philistine gathered there to fight, they went up and onto that place. The Bible says that this one rose up and wounded the, Philist the Philistine until he got, his, got tied with his hand. And his hand got attached to the sword. And that day, the Lord, through that man, operated a great deliverance and was great of, of the reward. And it's interesting, this. This man is a symbol of the Father, the Lord, the one who has the sword, the Word of God. So this man with the sword he defended Israel. He attacked the enemies of Israel until he got tired. 
But when he was tired, he didn't let go of the sword. He didn't release the sword. The sword got, got attached, glued to his hand. My brethren, what is the most powerful weapon on earth? If you ask the Americans, they were going to see, oh, they were going to give you a list of weapons that are very powerful, and they are really very powerful. The uh, nuclear warheads, the R-15, the M-16, the Glocks, lots of weapons. Rifles, machine gun, machine gun. But those are not the most powerful weapons in the world. The most powerful weapon on earth, do you know which, what it is? It's the Word of God. And that man with the sword. And we know that the sword is the Word of God. The shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and sword of the spirit, which is the Word of God. And with the Word of God, he was overcame all his enemies. He was victorious against all the enemies. He got tired but never let go of the word. And when we see, when we look upon this moment, what is the word of God in the mouth of the servant of God, what it represents, the benefit that it can bring, it is something amazing. David himself, when he went there to fight and defeat the giant, what was the weapon that he used? The word. You come with me, uh, uh, swords, but I go against you um, on the name of the King of Ho the Lord of Hosts. And they brought the word of God that brought victory for David and his people. So the word of God was inside of, of the heart of David. In Psalms, David said, I kept the word in my heart. And at the right moment, and left his, his heart, went through his mouth, and hit the opponent and gave victory to David and his people. When we come here, we pick up here an example of Paul in the New Testament. Paul in the New Testament, he says the following, because I have surely, I know that the affliction of the present moment will never compare it to the glory that will be revealed to him. And later on, Paul himself in the book of Romans, he says the following, because I'm sure that no nor death, nor life, nor the hosts of and the present and what is to come, nor the height, nor the depth, nor the angels, nor the creature can separate me from the love of God. Paul was tired, he got anguished, he saddened, but he never went astray from the word. But I have, uh, surely, I'm sure, so he had a conviction, he had faith, he had a guarantee that God was going to deliver him that God was going to take him out of that situation, that God was going to give him the victory, that God would never allow him to go astray from the great project that God had for his life. Sometimes you get tired, and it's natural of men to get afflicted, and it's natural of men. Man can, but man can never let go of the Word of God. Man can never give up on the plan, the project, and promise of God for his life. That's why this man, they battle, 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 and got tired, but he never let go of the sword. He never let go of the Word of God. And later on, the Apostle Paul says the following, I fought the good battle. I fought the good battle. My brother, my brethren, this is a good battle. All the affliction, problems, and difficulties, they are a good battle. They are an opportunity that God give us to be able to achieve victory through His Word. It's an opportunity that God gives us so that we can see that He is with us. The Lord of hosts is with us and God of Jacob, our refuge and fortress. And this assurance and conviction that man had, he opposed against a large number of people and 
he overcame all of them. Many enemies rose up and he de uh, overcame each one of them because he had a word. The word of the Lord is important to be attached. He joined, he fused his it would never leave his that man's hand and the word of the Lord needs to be always at our disposal to guide us, instruct us and give us the victory. There's a text that says the following the kingdom of God and Jesus himself says it's uh, victories are conquered through force but it's not human force not human strength with human strength that man would never be able to defeat his enemies but it was the strength that came from the Lord that came from above the Lord is my strength when we see Sansom the greatest example of, of strength the Bible says the following that then the Spirit of God took possession of Samson and then went there and killed a thousand people he picked up a lion and ripped the lion from top to bottom and I had an opportunity to be instructed and be taught on the path of the Lord by three pastors Paulo Alberto Souza Pires, Alberto Carlos Villanova, and Felipe Almeida. Three pastors. One was a shepherd, one was an evangelist, and the ever evangelist. They're like, uh, very excited, and a doctor, uh, a teacher. I went through those three ministries, and glory to God because I was able to live with and being with these three servants of God, these three valiant men of God. But one day I was in the church with one of those valiant men of God, and this valiant was laying down on the bench of the church. And the service about to start, he was laying down on the bench, and I arrived, and I was a deacon. And I was thinking, what the heck is this? The service was about to start, and the pastor was there laying down on the bench. He was going through a moment of great affliction, great anguish, many problems. And I came to him and said, How are you doing, my friend? And he began to talk to me, explaining the, his situation. And he was tired, very tired, anguished, sad. And sometimes a brother may think that pastor never get anguish, sad, and tired. I get tired, anguish, sadness, crying, all those things, sickness. Uh, <coughs> I went through three surgeries in the past in my life. And he was in the bench laying down, and I said, the services are going to start at any moment. Uh, what are we going to do? And he began to talk to me. But at the end of this dialogue, he said the following, Sabado, my brother, here it is. I'm going to heaven. If I'm not able to walk, I will crawl, but I'm going to heaven. But as soon as he said this sentence, something amazing happened. This man and I, a strength came into him and I, so that our understanding at that moment we could be victorious against anything, anything that would uh, face, we would be able to defeat. Because not a, a strength that came from men, it was a strength that came from God. And that man got up, completely healed, went to the pulpit there, preached a message, a wonderful message, and the whole church cried and praised the Lord. So it was the assurance. He was tired, he was anguished, he was tired, but he never let go of the sword. I'm sure the affliction, the present moment, cannot compare with what awaits us in heaven. So the word was attached to his hand, and the Lord at that moment gave him strength. And as Paul says, I know that not even death, and if the death came there, I would be able to defeat it. I had strength for that. If the angel came that was not from the Lord, we would be able to uh, give it a bidding. 
he would be leaving that place humiliated because it was strength from the Lord. So we see this in the word of the Lord, in the life of those amazing men. Sama. The Bible says that he defended a field filled with lentils, filled, uh, filled with uh, food. He defended alone. He was able to defend the entire field because a field would feed the servants of the Lord. The children of Israel. And we see this in the in the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that He alone defended the field of the Lord when He went there to the cross of Calvary, and He died there in order to defend the work, the project of God, to defend our salvation, our redemption. He paid a high price, but He was victorious. And then we see this in the, in the example of those three men, amazing, extraordinary men. And we think like this. So then, in the, in the kingdom of David, there were only valiant men, men that were able to do everything. There were only men of war. No, there were other men. Because they were, are all necessary for the kingdom of David of God. The church is the body of Christ. The Lord was showing for Israel that every person has a place in the body. They were all part of the project of God. And the third verse that we read, the th verse 30, Chronicles 30, let me find it, 12.32, speak of this Sunday. Isaac Carr. It, the Bible doesn't say that they were valiants, that they did great, amazing deeds, that they defeated a thousand or eight hundred, that they defended and that they opposed to anyone, that they were victorious, but it speaks of something interesting. The Bible says that the sons of Isaac Carr were, they were uh, wise in this understanding of the times. They were there to discern time. It is interesting. Discernment is one of the gift, spiritual gifts, wisdom, knowledge, gift of curing, discernment of um, tongues and interpretation. They were there to discern time. So there were valiant men, valuable men, men that defended the flock, men that attacked, men that were used to give victory to Israel, men that were able to protect the food, to preserve the word of God, the project of God, because the food gives strength to men. The Bible speaks of a man called Elijah, he was a little uh, discouraged, he was a prophet of God. The Bible says that an angel went there and gave food to him and said, with the strength of this food, he walked 40 days and 49 until he went to Horeb, the mountain of God. So there needs to be the, the valent to defend the food, the word of God, the re revealed word, the plan, the project of God, and the kingdom of David. All those things existed, but there were also men that were uh, who had understanding of the times. What does it mean? The Bible says that there were 200 men. When we speak of two, we speak of fellowship. There were 200 men that were in complete fellowship with God. But two is fellowship, right? And zero is the type of man. Zero and zero is two zeros. So they were with fellowship with God, but also with fellowship with men, with their, their brethren. They were in the light, they were in the revelation. The Apostle John says this in the first letter of John. He says, if we walk in the light, in the same way that, way that he walks in the light, <coughs> we fellowship with the brethren, and the blood of Jesus purified us from everything. So those were men, and the Bible doesn't say their names. 
but those were men that were that were part of the kingdom of Israel, men that were in fellowship with God, and fellowship with all of those that participated in the kingdom, and those men that were there to discern time. And the work of the Holy Spirit is necessary that we have these brothers and sisters to discern time. We are living the time of that's called time called soon. We're reading of the letters, the Revelation, Ephesus, Emerging, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Even when we read the letters, it says that whoever has on the right hand the seven uh, stars, the first and the last uh, sword with two edges, and the last letter, it says the following, I am at the door and I knock. And if in the work of David there, there are not men like those sons of Ashakar to discern this moment, to give the alert so that the people get ready, they will never be victorious in the battles. So we see here that the sons of Ashakar, they were, they had dexterity in science. There were men that were able to discern the time. There's a song of ours that says, The signs of the end are fulfill being fulfilled in our generation. It is to discern the time in which we are living, the time of the signs, the time of the sounding of the trumpets, the time in which Jesus is coming. Our children, there's a song that says the following. Uh, there's a song that says, In the Express train where we travel, and it's at the time of the departure. So there is a discernment uh, regarding the time in which we're living. And the Lord has used men and women at this moment. They are nameless, they are anonymous, but they are being used by God to show the church the time called soon, the time in which we are living, the time of our departure. And it says to, so that Israel would be able to know what to do. My brethren, we're being instructed and taught by the Holy Spirit that has been sent to His servants to the things that are about to happen, like what is written in the book of Revelations. And it is interesting that those men, they were uh, delivering the word to the people of God, to the children of Israel, to those that were in the kingdom of David, in order for them to know what Israel needed to know, needed to do. And the word says that everyone, look how it is written, that all of them, they followed his word. David was the king. He had their valiant men that discerned the time. And these people that discerned the time, they instructed the people. The entire people followed the word. Why did all the people follow the word? Because it was an instruction of God to the entire people. The whole people accepted because it was a direction of the Holy Spirit to Israel. As it is today, a direction of the Holy Spirit for the church. All the teachings that are being transmitted about the time called soon, the moment of uh, that is soon to come, the letters of Revelation were instructing and alerting the church for a moment, a moment that have been, we have been waiting for a long time because our salvation is closer. That's what it says in the Word of the Lord. The Word says, I tell you, knowing the time, because it's time for us to wake up from the sleep because our salvation is closer. So then the people, they heard the Word, that was discerned regarding the moment in which they were living, and the whole people there, they followed the word that was being proclaimed so that they would get ready. My brethren, we are living this moment. We don't know the day or the time, but we know that the signs are out there showing uh, the time called soon, the time of the, the, the rapture of the church. And today, the Lord has been doing this. 
using men and women to discern this time and to transmit to the church this time so that the church may be prepared for this great day and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing a song right now. Glory to God. We're going to have two words, glorification of the Lord, for this work of the Holy Spirit that one day was able to reach our lives. We are privileged because the Holy Spirit has freedom to operate in our midst. The Holy Spirit has freedom to flow, to act, to govern our lives. And for us, it's a great gift from the Lord that we are part of this kingdom. We're not part of the church Maranatha, but we're part of this kingdom that is growing, that is expanding every day more and more because the work is of the Lord. We're here because the Lord one day called us and was able to reach us. And for us, is a, a moment of great joy. That this month, we are working for the work of the Lord with all the world. The country that the Lord is also able to reach, the churches. So we're going to have two words of glorification to the Lord. Lord, we want to praise you. Because one day you gave a beloved son so that we would be able to have this moment in your presence. Beloved Father, We'll give you praise because one day we're able to reach you and you reached us first. Thank you, Lord, for your great love, for everything that you have done to our lives. We're thankful to you, Lord. We're thankful also for this word, Lord, that came towards our hearts, for this word that came from eternity because we need, Lord, to be in your presence and to be Lord more valiant Lord so we ask more faith to you Lord so that we may be able to continue walking forward and show this great love that one day you gave us and that you may be able to make use Lord 
of us so that we may be able to express this great love to everyone, Lord. Because we have not lacked anything. We have been present in our life. And at this moment, Lord, especially, I want to thank you for our lives, for my life, for everything that you have done and you continue to do. Place my life in your presence, Lord. We ask that you may be able to use us more and more, Lord. We give you graces, grace to you. Thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we we'll also glorify, we we'll give you praise, Lord. Because nothing compares to your love. We thank you, Lord, because one day you found us first, Lord. You brought us into your presence. You have sustained us every day, Lord, with your powerful hands, Lord. You raise your name high up, Lord, because you have prepared a place for me, Lord, so that we may be able to be with you eternally, which you are the celestial mansions, Lord. We glorify you, Lord, for everything. And we can say that we are more than victorious in your presence. Blessed be your name in the name of Jesus. Do the children have a song? Oh, no. Going to have, they, they are going to sing without the... Oh, the praise group doesn't know. Uh, they, they are secondary. Go, Jonah. Figure stuff out, Jonah. Now we're going to and sing everything, everybody together, the church. Glory to God. We will stand up. Who wants to pray? Of the children, do the children want to pray? Microphone, John. Without microphone, they don't pray. <laughs> Bless the service, Lord. Bless the service tonight. Bless our lives. So thank for everything that you have done for our lives. Touching the heart of everyone that is outside of the church, Lord, bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we plead for the blood of Jesus. Thanks because we have a church. Thanks for the service. Thanks because you died for us so that we can be here and praise the Lord in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The children can kneel down. The children on the last and intermediary. When the deacons will pray. Lord, give deliverance. Physical health, spiritual health. We ask that you may be blessing your little servants to light up the path of salvation 
for the homes that are broken up, use them for salvation, wherever they don't have, wherever they are as they studying the, so that the angel of the Lord may be around them and the grace of the Lord, the abundance of, of the Lord be upon them and that they, the world may not attract them and that they may be preserved for the honor of your name. Bless the parents represented here and the family represented here in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to sing another song. Which one? Holy, holy is the name of the Lord. Lord to Jesus. Lord to God. Lord Father, we ask that your word this morning we may be may remain in each heart of your servants that came to your house this morning. 
Lord, we ask that your spirit may have freedom to, of transforming our understanding and that we may be able to love more this work of the Lord. We ask that we may leave this place closer to you with a greater desire, with a greater commitment with your Holy Spirit. And we ask that we may awake those that are discouraged, those who are tired, those who are sad in the Lord. And that your spirit may have freedom to renew them this morning. And that we may leave this place uh, with the boldness that come from, your, from your, your kingdom, Lord. Be able to carry the commitment we one day we took with you. Operate in the homes, operate in each life. We pray that we say in the name of Jesus. In your name we say that the wonderful grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, our eternal Father, the sweet and tender consolations of and gift of the Holy Spirit be poured out upon us now and forevermore. Amen. The church may be seated. Amen. Tonight, we're going to have youth meeting, 6.15, right? 6.15, right? The youth have, has to come early. They're coming 6.20, no, 6.15. is the beginning, kneeling down here. So get prepared, leave a little early from home so that we don't miss the pleading. Every meeting, every service, the pleading is primordial, it's very important. For every topic that we tackle here, we need to plea. We ask the brethren to continue praying for the acquisition of the location. We, the negotiation, no, okay. I give the peace of the Lord to everyone. We have um, 